As news outlets all around the world continue to publish articles about the upcoming Great Recession and the fact that the S&P index has dropped almost 21% year to date, should we as investors be concerned with our current strategy of dollar cost averaging into the S&P 500 index? In this video, we're going to be looking at this question and whether it's a good idea and what are the risks. So what is the S&P 500? Well, essentially the S&P 500 is just a market tracking index of the top 500 companies that are listed on the US stock exchanges. This approximates to about 80% of the market capitalization of all US listed companies. According to SP Global, the S&P 500 index was created in 1957, making it the first US market cap weighted stock market index. As of the 31st of December 2020, SP Global estimates that there is approximately 5.4 trillion US dollars that's invested globally into products that actually track this index. There are over 165 index listed products listed on the S&P Global website alone. Although the S&P 500 index was officially launched in 1957, the valuation goes back all the way to the 3rd of January, 1928. But it's important that you understand before 1957, this is only a hypothetical back-tested index and therefore it's not actual performance of U the US 500 top listed companies, but instead based on an index methodology that was actually established at the time of listing this index. Now, one of the products that's actually listed on the SP Global website as tracking the S&P 500 index is the SPY. Now the SPY or Spider S&P 500 ETF Trust was the first ETF listed in the US according to State Street Global Division launched in January, 1993. Now the fund objective is like all other funds that track the S&P 500 index. So this instrument's main goal is to provide exposure to the price and then the yield performance of the S&P 500 index before expenses. According to Statista, as of the 21st of June, 2022, the SPY is the largest market ETF in the world by assets under management with approximately 336 billion US dollars under management. But despite being well diversified across a number of industries and the fact that this index is actually built from the top performing companies within those industries in the US, during periods of economic distress and uncertainty, the S&P index and related ETFs can and will go down substantially. This happens as businesses and analysts across the financial industry re-evaluate and re-estimate their cost basis going forward and therefore their cash flows and growth prospects into the future. Now, one of the most common pieces of advice I see around the internet for people of our generation is that we should be doing dollar cost averaging into the S&P 500 into a market tracking index. Even Warren Buffett recommends this strategy to investors who don't wanna devote the time to do their own business analysis. So I really wanted to question this general knowledge and actually instead of looking for papers on the internet telling me that it's the best thing to do possibly for passive investing, I wanted to go through the numbers and look at the historical S&P 500 index, create a synthetic SPY uh, like investment product and then consider a 25 year holding period for different age individuals looking for retirement over that period. We're then going to look at all the results and judge whether lump sum investing or dollar cost averaging is better and what the risks are associated with each of those strategies. So to kick things off, let's look at the performance of investing in the SPY ETF over the last 25 years. Two individuals, one is a 25 year old in July 1997 who comes into 300,000 US dollars. Now he is going to lump sum invest into the SPY. The other 25 year old at the same time time only has $10 to his name. However, he's just begun working, saving, and plans to invest 1,000 US dollars per month on the first trading day of the month in the SPY ETF. Now, we're going to be quite harsh on these individuals. Every trade they make, we're going to make the assumption that they're paying $10 in brokerage fees, which is uh, very conservative. We're also going to make the unrealistic assumption that they're able to buy on the closing price on that particular trading day. Now, we're going to track both of these strategies through to today at when they're 50 years old and see how they've done over the last 25 years. Now, unsurprisingly, the 25 year old who came into $300,000 and invested it in the SPY has done extremely well. 
He has just under $1.24 million at the end of the term with a total return of $924,000. In comparison, the person who's been dollar cost averaging finishes up at the age of 50 with $772,000 for a gross return of $472,000. Although they have made a positive return, there are periods where they had contributed more money than the value of those current uh, SPY ETF shares. And this is important to remember Remember that despite being short-term fluctuations, that over the long term in both of these scenarios, we have actually got a positive result with quite a good annualized return. Now, if we consider this in terms of gross percentages, the lump sum investor received a 313% gross return, while the dollar cost averaging investor received 157% return. This is slightly unfair because really the person who was working and contributing $1,000 every month did not have that capital to invest at the time. So what we actually need to consider is what was the fund value return for that particular investment. Now calculating the fund value return methodology is simply just with respect to the cash flows and the actual number of units of the underlying. So for example, when the first investor buys X amount of shares in with $1,000 and then comes back into the market and buys another Y units of shares, then all you're doing is you're accounting for the time differences between those two investments to get a weighted um, average cost of capital for your total units of share. Consider it this way, essentially each time you're buying X units of shares, you're buying it for a certain price and those units make it all the way to the end of maturity if you hold on to them and the return for that particular investment over that time period is calculated then. You then come back into the market in one month time and then you buy X units of shares or Y units of shares, it could be different, for a different price. And now you need to consider how many units of Y shares returns over that time period all the way until your holding period. And then you do this continually for the next 25 years. So the fund value return takes into all these cash flow considerations and extra units of shares into consideration. Now, when you look at the fund value return of this second investor who dollar cost averaged in, essentially he gets and converges to on the money that he's invested, the actual percentage return that the lump sum investor got into and that is 312.5. Now it's not exactly because of course there is timing differences and inefficiencies over the long run. Now for both the lump sum investor and the dollar cost average investor, their then adjusted annual return equates to about 5.84. So now what happens if you weren't 25 and started investing dollar cost averaging into the market in July, 1997? What happens if instead you were 25 in June 1997? Or what happens if you were 25 and you were wanting to invest over the next 25 years in the January 1928? So we're going to look at all the permutations of a person who comes to the age of 25, begins working and then investing $1,000 dollar cost averaging into the market for the next 25 years. We're then going to compare that to the lump sum investor who comes into $300,000 and we're going to look at the results. So the number of 25 year periods that we have for a person who starts investing at a particular month from January 1928 all the way through to today would actually only be 833. And again, that's with the last date that you could have invested is in July 1997 to get that 25 year holding period to today. So let's now consider those 833 scenarios and look at the distributions and the returns. So now going through the assumptions that we have related to creating a synthetic ETF, going back all the way through uh, to 1929. The first is that we can actually buy for the closing price on a particular day, which is complete bogus, but it's gonna do for this analysis. Two, we have no fees or management fees connected with this ETF, so no expenses. Now, this is somewhat netted off by our next assumption, which is that we do not take dividends from these uh, investments over time. And obviously ETFs do incorporate the dividends that they get from the 500 companies within the ETF. Now, this is the important one. The synthetic ETF is holding the one-tenth of the value 
of the index and this is in line with how the SPY index and ETF is created. Now the other assumption we're making is that we're not going to be adjusting for inflation. These are going to be nominal values. So now I'm going to show you the gross returns between the two strategies. Now, the first thing that I want you to notice is that on the y-axis of both of these plots, I am showing you the gross total returns as a dollar figure. And I want you to notice the sheer difference between these blue bars over time from one strategy to the other. I also want to make it clear that this is the 25 year holding period where uh, it's recorded at the end. So the investor is 50 years old and you realize your P&L and that is where the bar is shown. Now, the second thing that I really want you to notice is that there are negative returns in the lump sum uh, investment strategy. Now, these are occurring in January 1929 and then also when you started investing in September 1929. Now these were the real high points before the Great Depression hit in the United States. Now the Great Depression was from 1929 through to 1933 but obviously the economy didn't really recover until after World War II. During this time period unemployment rose to 25% and the gross domestic product the GDP of the USA decreased by 30%. Now other than starting at these two individual points in terms of months for your lump sum investing, essentially with both strategies in any other month period, you would have had a positive return over your 25 year holding period. Now looking at the distributions, let's look at the lump sum distribution. And what I want you to realize is that it's highly volatile with a minimum of minus $10,000 return over a 25 year period, all the way up to $5.9 million. But historically over time, we can see that the absolute gross return of the lump Lump sum investing strategy with 90% confidence intervals are between $470,000 to $3.2 million. Now this is with a median return of $1.4 million and a mean return of $1.56 million. Now let's compare this to DCA which we can obviously see never produce negative returns. We have a max of $1.99 million, nearly $2 million and a minimum of $96,000. We can say with 90% confidence that over this given strategy that the DCA approach is between $160,000 to up to a gross return of $1.4 million. This is with a median of $560,000 and a mean of $610,000. Now let's talk about the risk. Essentially what happens in the worst 5% of cases? I want to know what my expectation is, the mean of the 5% worst cases in both scenarios. So in the 5% worst cases for the lump sum, essentially this would equate to $180,000 whereas in the DCA strategy, these 5% uh, worst case outcomes would be on average $130,000. Now, this is amazing to see that even in such low probability odds of this investing strategy, that over time, you still expect in 5% worst cases to receive quite a positive return on top of your $300,000 worth of invested capital over time. Now, lastly, we're just going to compare the annualized returns for all these different scenarios. Now, you obviously hear that everyone says, hey, look, the S&P 500 is going up at 7% over time, but that's the line and that's for the lump sum investing. What about for the dollar cost averaging approach? Well, essentially the dollar cost averaging annualized returns when considered as the fund value return approach, you're considering when the cash flows happen and the returns of those individual investments over time, when you consider those annualized returns, you, you eventually converge upon the lump sum uh, distribution as you can see here. And essentially we can say with 90% confidence interval that the annualized returns of both of these strategies are between 3.85 to 10.3% with a median of 7.2% and a mean of 7.07%. So I think this has been an important analysis because what we've seen is that over a 25 year holding period, using a lump sum approach has actually in the past would have returned a negative gross return. However, using the dollar cost averaging approach, what you do is you space your capital out over time and you would have averaged in at lower 
points. Although we never saw negative returns in our 25 year holding periods from 1928 onwards, what I will say is that the distribution was a lot tighter and a lot smaller in terms of gross returns for dollar cost averaging compared to lump sum. Lump sum did have a very large upside with a noticeably larger median value. And that's why in general you have heard the investing approach that when you do have a large sum of cash, it's better just to be in the game rather than not. This is not investment advice, but I think what we can establish from this that obviously over time you are not guaranteed a 7% return whether you were lump sum investing or dollar cost averaging into the S&P 500 ETF or index tracking funds. With that being said, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and leave a comment in the section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the analysis or similar analysis that you've done.